The eye of all the world, the ancients called it. The heart of a lost empire that had lasted for a thousand years and more. Saint Sophia, the church of the divine wisdom. This was their crowning glory, the glory of Byzantium. Come to Istanbul, and underneath the magic ruins of the lost empire of Byzantium. Istanbul, one of the very greatest of Islamic cities, with the monuments of the conquering Turkish sultans who had ruled here since 1453, dominating its skyline. Underneath, though, are much older ghosts, brushed each day by people of the living city, the ruins of Constantinople, the capital city of the Empire of Byzantium. Istanbul, Constantinople, two names, new and old, for the same grand city. Sixteen centuries ago, in the year 330, the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian Roman Emperor, chose this city, then a small Greek town, to be his capital. No one quite knows why. This mosque, the mosque of the Turkish Sultan who conquered the city, is built straight on the foundations of the most ancient burial church of the mysterious emperors of old Byzantium. This is where the empire of Byzantium began, beside this ancient column here on Main Street. A lonely ancient relic in a modern city. In the year of our Lord 330, on a lovely May morning, a great procession came down this road. It was the highway of an ancient city called Byzantium. And the procession was led by the great Roman Emperor Constantine. And he'd brought with him a bunch of priests, pagan and Christian ones, and they were all holding an incredible collection of relics. There were 12 baskets filled with crumbs, the residue, it was said, of our Lord's miracle of the loaves and fishes, there was the very axe that Noah made the ark with. And there was a statue that the emperor himself had brought secretly from Rome, a statue of the Greek god Pallas. And at an exact moment prescribed by astrologers, they buried their relics just over there, at the foot of the column. Seven drums of porphyry brought from the Egyptian deserts. And Constantine renamed the city Constantinople and claimed it as the capital of his grand new empire. You know, over the years, the column itself came to be seen as a relic. And the Byzantines, that's the people who lived in this city, called it Christ's Nail because they thought that the great golden statue of Constantine upon the top had something of one of the nails from Christ's crucifixion built into it. And every year on the New Year's Day, that's the 1st of September, the Byzantines turned up at the bottom of this column and sung hymns to Saint Constantine, the founder of their city and the mighty empire called Byzantium. Constantinople was designed to be the center of the Christian world the center of Christ's government on earth. These great cups were made to hold the mystery of Christ's blood inside the city's churches. Churches glowing with Roman gold and ancient holy images. 
images that for a thousand years flooded right through Europe and the East. This then is Byzantium's first story, the story of how in two short centuries a dream was made. The dream that was Byzantium. In the year 360, Constantine's son built a magnificent church at Constantinople, especially for the drama of imperial communion. Next door, those same pious emperors built a giant racetrack, the Hippodrome. You can still see part of its outline in the streets. And here at last, around this old Egyptian obelisk, you can discover something of the atmosphere of ancient Constantinople, the heart of old Byzantium. This stone's like a giant mirror, reflecting all the life that once went on around it. There's the emperor and his family, Constantine's successors, come to the royal box to start a chariot race. There's the obelisk in the middle of the racetrack, and the chariots too, eight of them running all at once. You'd need a lot of luck to win. This place wasn't just a racetrack, though. This is a place where people met the emperor and his court. It's the air, the space of Byzantium, 100,000 people roaring as new emperors are presented to them, as captives from foreign wars are brought and thrown at the feet of the emperor. It's the old parliament. It's the real heart of Byzantium. And that scene there, where have you seen it before? Look at it carefully. The emperor's in the middle with his family just like God. Around them stand the army and the court, just like the saints. Beneath them, begging mercy, are Byzantium's enemies, the damned. It's a grand last judgment right here on earth with the emperor playing God. So that's it, really. The emperor brings happiness and harmony. The theater brings luck and victory. This is the center of the world, an image, you might say, of heaven on earth. So if we'd have pushed open the gates of the imperial palace that once stood beside the Hippodrome, we'd have really been opening the earthly gates of paradise. Arcades of gold and marble, silver boats on pools of mercury, silk carpets, golden thrones in halls of porphyry and pearls. All are gone. Only echoes of them still remain in Syria and Italy. Once, though, Constantinople held the palace of all palaces, the palace of the Christian Empire. Church, Hippodrome, and Palace. Constantine had made a sacred engine that would power Byzantium forever. To protect the holy city of Constantinople, the emperors of Byzantium built the largest city walls in all the world. Armies that controlled the lives of millions rode from these gates. And through them, passed the produce of an empire. The whole history of this city is in this gate. The great golden gate of imperial Byzantium. You see that great high span at the top? That was once open to the skies. For 600 years, emperors and armies rode through that gate in triumph, coming back from wars against the Persians, the Arabs, the Bulgarians, the Russians. Then there was an earthquake. The gate was blocked. And that final gate at the bottom, that even a cavalryman couldn't come through on a horse, that gate was built in the final years of Byzantium. 
So this is a magic gate. It's a gate of legends. They say its wooden doors were covered with sheets of gold to give the gate its name. They say that the very last emperor killed fighting on these walls is buried beneath these stones, waiting for a call to take the city once again. So it's a gate of legend, but above all, it speaks of imperial Byzantine power. This was once a marble square on a highway at the middle of Constantinople. I don't suppose the Turks of modern Istanbul think much about ancient Byzantine victories. Yet there's still some fragments here of that great memorial column that made it all the way from Marmara. The ghosts of the imperial armies still lining the routes of their processions through the city. Just as all the ancient roads and sea lanes ran through the empire to Constantinople, so did the rivers of the region, channeled into great aqueducts, bringing treasured water to a thirsty city. Underneath the town, cut deep into its hilltop, an eerie underworld, some 15 centuries old. Fresh water systems so that the Byzantines could bathe just like the Romans did, in marble halls. And everything made with the dazzling technology of ancient Rome, the father of Byzantium. Marble columns, high brick vaults, the dark forests of Byzantium beneath modern Istanbul. The Byzantines loved fresh bread and fresh vegetables. Well, the bread, at least the grain for it, they brought from their province of Egypt, the vegetables they grew themselves. In little plots beside their houses in the city, in fields in a great green swathe that ran for mile upon mile down the walls of the city. And here's still a bit of it today growing more or less the same crops. Look at the garlic, the onions, the dill. The dill they use to flavor fish, especially those heavy yellow fish soups they so love. And this, well, this is an ecological Byzantine delight here. There's three or four different sorts of crocs. There's rocket for salad. There's chard and cabbage again. All sorts of things, mint, all growing together in a great profusion. And at the end of it all, lettuce to calm your stomach. So when the peasants in the fields just stop there for a moment and straighten their backs to watch the lords of Byzantium, those great history makers riding by, they too could think, we're not having such a bad time either. The Byzantine economy was based on the classic Mediterranean diet, wine, grain, cheese, and vegetables, and olives. Olive oil was a staple. It was Byzantium's fuel. It lit streets and homes and lighthouses. It oiled carts and cured baldness. And it was used for cooking. In its first century, Constantinople's oil came mostly from northern Syria. This is Sajila one of 300 ancient Syrian villages with Byzantine olive groves. Provincial Byzantium, preserved in fine-cut stone. If you'd have come up this path 1,500 years ago on the 1st of September, you'd have been accompanied by thousands of people shouting and singing praises to the Lord. It was the feast day of Saint Simon of the Pillar.
The first place these processions came to was this great baptistry. 10,000 people, whole cities full, had been baptised in this room in a single day. And then out they all went, praising the Lord, onwards to the church of the saints. It's Roman architecture still, of course. Arches, vaults and column tops. But now, there's Christian crosses too. The ancient forms are turning into something else. See? The wind of faith is bending all those ancient pagan patterns. This is the style that would become Byzantium. And at the church's hub, the remains of the 50-foot column on which St. Simon lived. Simon, it was a vital element in this new Christian empire, an element which somehow had taken the old stern order of the Roman age and left it halfway between heaven and earth. In the eastern Mediterranean, in the warm heartland of the pagan world, the first Christian empire, the empire of Byzantium, had found its balance. It was a good life, a rich life, and there was peace and plenty. You know, it always strikes me as funny when people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire. After all, Standing here in Constantinople, it just got richer and richer and richer. Didn't fall at all. I suppose really it's because Rome fell. In fact, Rome didn't fall, it just got poor. Constantine had moved the capital from the great old cities of the west to here in the east. And with him moved the government, the generals, the artists and the architects. Everybody who made the empire moved with him. So in 475, that's 25 years after these walls were finished, the last Roman emperor of the West, a young man, a junior emperor, sent the crown back here to Constantinople, to New Rome. This was the new city. And I suppose, really, the story about the fall of the Roman Empire, that's the Western Empire, was really invented in the Renaissance by the popes, who really wanted to get the idea of a pagan empire falling and the Christian Empire of the West rising. They're good propagandists like Raphael and Michelangelo to budge them on their way. But the truth is, the real truth is, that old Rome, ancient Rome, had been modelled on the great cities of the East, on Antioch and Alexandria, all those great marble cities. So when you say Rome fell, it didn't fall at all. It simply went back home again. After the last emperor of the West resigned, Byzantium lost most of its European provinces. Only for a century, though. By the year 555, brand new Byzantine armies had ruthlessly reconquered some of them. And in northern Italy at Ravenna, they left triumphant decorations in this church as their memorial. The man there is Justinian, the emperor who 200 years after Constantine completely remade the Roman Empire. The man who made Byzantium. He was a man, they said, who was gentle and approachable. A man who never showed his anger. A man who in the quietest of voices could order the death of thousands. He didn't organize the empire completely by himself, though. His great strength was as a manager. Those strong faces that surround him were the faces of a great team of men he'd picked together. And he didn't really care whether they were Roman patricians or from the humblest, roughest backgrounds. He himself actually come from a completely illiterate peasant family in Serbia. Justinian, though, was only half the picture. The other half was that most remarkable woman over there, the Empress Theodora. They'd married each other for love, and they stayed together for 25 years. And look at the young ladies of the court there. They're looking sideways and a bit nervous. You see, it's not proper for young girls to look straight at you, not unless 
You're a woman of power like Theodora. But that is actually a portrait of a woman dying of cancer. Within two or three months of this mosaic being finished, Theodora was dead. Justinian ruled for another 20 years. He never remarried, and he went to her grave and lit candles until he was a very old man. Though Justinian and Theodora restored the Roman Empire, this was no longer the ancient classical world. They lived in a different age, spoke Eastern Greek instead of Roman Latin. Justinian and Theodora had planned to build new palaces and churches such as the world had never seen. The ancient forms, arches, vaults and column tops were being used for something revolutionary. Something that will be echoed in 10,000 different churches for a thousand years and more. The style that is Byzantium. This seaside church, set right beside the palace, was made for some of Theodora's favorite priests. It was probably the work of one Anthemius, a famous physician and mathematician. Just look at that great big glorious dome, like a huge melon, divided into 16 sections and held by eight wonderful swinging arches on those extraordinary V-shaped pillars and 28 columns through the church. It's like a vast net of stone and brick slung over this central space, this strange, mysterious space for the Imperial Communion. And Themis's engineers use rather a lot of iron in their buildings. It's part of a whole new series of techniques that allow them to think more daringly, more bravely than any other architects had done before. Above all, it enabled Justinian himself to have the ambition to conceive of the greatest dome the world has ever seen. Such mysterious cargoes, such magic marvels from across the empire, now sailed the seas and came to the holy city of Byzantium to be gathered up upon the site of the Imperial Communion. This is the finished dream, the tense climax of all of ancient engineering, a lively frame built with prayer and pragmatism to hold the largest dome the world had ever seen. This, though, is just the outside of a sacred theatre. Inside, a forest of columns rises up in ecstasy. The walls, glass and gold and marble, light and dark, insubstantial and illusory, seem to simply fade away. perfect sea of space for God's holy wisdom to come down and touch the earth. A perfect theatre for the anthems of Byzantium. Lo, the lords of heaven and earth have come. No wonder the building has itself become a legend. Poets said the church combined the size of sunset and the scale of quarries. In Byzantine, in Greek, this church was called the Church of Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. All of Justinian's enormous empire, its wealth, its piety, its pagan heritage, was gathered up inside it. Throughout the next nine centuries, this vast old building stood right at the center of Byzantium, 
a symbol of its true destiny on Earth. And on the last day of Byzantium, the Emperor and his troops came here to pray before they walked out onto the city walls to die. For these were the vaults that held the dream, the dream that was Byzantium. This is the heart of the ancient palace of the Popes of Rome. It's centuries older than the Vatican and filled with holy wonders. Believers say that Jesus Christ once walked upon these steps, that they were taken from Pontius Pilate's palace in Jerusalem. The steps were brought to Rome in the first centuries of Christianity and a reverence still by millions of people every year who pass up them on their knees deep in penitential prayer. Inside the ancient chapel at their top, Rome's most holy picture, an image made, so it was said, not by human hands at all, a portrait so powerful that when deep in the Dark Ages, the barbarians stood at the gates of ancient Rome, the awe-inspiring image crippled the tribesmen with its paralyzing gaze and sent them running back to Germany. Paintings entirely encased in silver. The nearest you can get to it is that little face on the top, which is actually painted on linen and lays right on the ancient panel. And that type of face, a round one with dark hair, is probably the nearest you can get to an authentic portrait of Jesus. The original was said to have been painted on the walls of Pontius Pilate's palace by the first Christians. The real painting underneath it's been entirely washed away a thousand years ago. That doesn't matter, really. This is more than a picture. It is literally a window into heaven, a link between divinity and the earth. The Romans call their painting the Acheropita, an ancient Eastern word that means a picture made in heaven. It was actually made in the seventh century in the Empire of Byzantium, part of a standard set of pictures of the people of the Bible. All those images come from the East. They're our most basic images of kings and gods and governments, of heroes and mothers and villains, all those types we take for granted. And their story of how they got from the East to the modern West is an astonishing tale. They've come through fire. It's a story of blindings and hatreds and the light of faith. It's our story, and it's a part of the story of Byzantium, too. The first imperial images to tell the stories of the Christian Bible, to symbolize its faith, came from this city, a thousand miles to the east of Rome, ancient Constantinople, now Istanbul in modern Turkey. The Emperor Constantine the Great dedicated this column when he founded Constantinople in the year 330. From that year on, the city stood at the heart of Constantine's vast empire, the first Christian state, master of the greatest cities the world had ever seen, Alexandria, Antioch and Rome, and the capital of the brand new empire of Byzantium. From the very beginning, Constantinople really sizzled. New religion, new state, new government, everything here was up for grabs. Amazingly enough, 
we have a good idea of how it felt to be alive inside this city and at just this time in history. It's a 1,500-year-old press photo. It's not on film, though. It's on ivory. There's the pole for the poor old elephant's tusk. The Byzantines imported ivory from India and from Africa. This probably came from Africa because it's so enormous. It would have come, of course, through Egypt, up through the empire to Constantinople. The Byzantines loved ivory. They thought it had a texture like living skin. This, then, is the only glimpse we have of life in Constantinople in about the year 420. It's a procession. Two priests are carrying the bones of St. Stephen of Jerusalem on a royal carriage into the imperial palace of Byzantium. The mighty emperor Theodosius II is walking with his ministers and soldiers right through the center of the city. Theodosius procession would have passed up this very street. This is modern Istanbul. In those days, in the 5th century, it was called Constantinople. We're walking between the docks and the ancient centre of the city. I suspect it was much the same in those days. But there would have been thousands of people watching the emperor on his way to the palace. Do you know, these processions, especially at that time, were a very tense affair. These sort of cities, these great classical cities, were a thousand years old. The Christian bishops that ran them were starting to look at them with brand new eyes. The times really were a changing. They saw the rich on the way to church to tend to their souls, kicking beggars out of the way by the doors of the church, children mutilated by their parents to make them look more pitiful. And they saw the rich women walking, they said, with a thousand meals swinging from their ears. And they didn't like what they saw. The Christian bishops wanted a moral city, a sexless city, a pure city, and a more equitable city, too. So that, perhaps, is why the emperor isn't sitting in his carriage, but walking in the street and carrying a candle with his courtiers, from the bones of a poor man from Palestine riding in the royal coach. The emperor's procession was on its way to a grand square, halfway between the palace and the court church. I think our ivory procession would have passed through here, right through the heart of the ancient city. Now, you see that Turkish bath over there? That's in about the same place as the gate on our ivory. And see the great high dome on the gate? And see that figure of Christ, that face of Christ on the gate? That was such a famous figure. It was called Christ of the Gateway. The most famous and influential portrait of Christ it was copied from the great shining ivory statue of Zeus of the Seven Wonders. That was parked in a palace just over there. Now, think of our procession moving along. You see, they're going past this great portico, three high stories of it, people peering out arches, looking down, swinging their incense, pleased to see the saint arriving in the city to make the new Jerusalem, joining heaven to earth. And over there, look, that's about a spot where the church, the brand new church of St. Stephen is being built. It's ready to receive the relics, but they haven't finished the roof and the tilers are still working away up there. But the empress is proudly waiting by the door, holding a cross. And that is quite extraordinary. For the first time in the ancient world, the centre of attention is not the emperor, but an empress. She carries the cross of victory. She receives the holy relics into her church. It's probably the virgin empress, Pulcheria. In that most ancient language, signs and symbols, the little ivory is telling us about an ancient revolution and one that still affects the world today. Imagine that it is Easter, April the 15th, 428, and that this nice new church is filled with all the nobles of Constantinople, men downstairs, women upstairs in the galleries.
Right on this line here, there was an altar rail. It separated the main body of the church from the high altar. Only the emperor and his priests were allowed in here, close to the divine mystery of communion. In 428, though, things were rather different. Theodosius, the emperor, was usually accompanied to the altar by his sister, Bulcaria. They'd ruled together since they'd been children, two frightened toddlers in a palace filled with intrigues and plots for the succession. When she was 14, Pulcheria had hit upon the answer. She dedicated an altar to her own virginity and to the rule of the emperor. From that moment on, they ruled a strange, sacred couple like Joseph and Mary, and there were no plots for the succession. It had also given Pulcheria a unique role within the church. Encouraged by Pulcheria, the next full council of the church declared Mary, the mother of Jesus, to be Mary, the mother of God. It was a defining moment. Thanks to Pulcheria, the family of the emperor of Byzantium had become a mirror image of the Holy Family in the court of heaven. That is why these medieval emperors offer their city and an image of this church, St. Sophia, Byzantium's cathedral, for the protection of the Virgin Mary. Christ's mother is their mother too. After Pulcheria, the emperors of Byzantium ruled by divine right and by right of birth, and all later Western kings imitated them. Pulcheria had cast that spell of power and sanctity that still surrounds the offices of government today. She'd also changed the way that men saw women and women saw themselves. In the year 867, on the 29th of March, the Patriarch of Constantinople, one Photius, dedicated the first pictorial mosaic in the Church of St. Sophia. Even in her image, Photius tells us, the Virgin graces and delights, she strengthens and she comforts us. Once again, the holy pictures filled Byzantium with their unearthly presence. In Saint Sophia, images of Christ were placed up in the dome and here, above the church's central door, where only the emperor could enter. Not the favorite Western image of a mortal Christ impaled in time upon a cross, the old familiar figure from the palace gate, Christ of all time and of all places, Christ Lord of the cosmos. Before this ancient image, penitent emperors now prostrate themselves in awe. This is a picture of a procession carrying an icon, and it was made six centuries ago, in the last years of Byzantium. It gives a precious glimpse of Constantinople's most famous image of the Virgin Mary, painted, it was believed, from the life by St. Luke himself. Underneath, for some of those who centuries before had fought iconoclasm and found their way to paradise. Saint Theodosia, the Virgin Martyr, the abbots of the monasteries, the artists, they hold the pictures that they died for. Pictures painted with such passion and precision, such blazing color, such quiet power,
They say that on the last night of Byzantium, on the evening of Monday, the 28th of May, in 1453, just hours before Constantinople fell to the armies of the Turks, that the Virgin came down into her city for the last time and took her picture back to heaven. So where is the holy palace of Byzantium in modern Istanbul? That's a lump of it there. That sad, pathetic pile of brick. You have to go into the streets, into the alleyways. You really need a map. Look, I'll show you. Modern Istanbul... Why the maps always open the wrong way? Modern Istanbul, ancient Constantinople. I'll show you what I mean. Look, there's the great Roman roads coming into the centre of town. The Hippodrome, where the people met the Emperor. The great church just beside it. And there, between that wall and that one there, that whole area was all palace. Dozens of buildings, dozens of churches, all together, high and glittering right across the hill. So, you might ask, where the hell is it now? The Golden Palace is buried beneath old Istanbul. The little streets are haunted by its lost pavilions, by ghosts of ancient gardens, by the shadows of its courtiers and generals. The enormous curve of the imperial racetrack still stands though, a shattered wonder of the medieval world. We're right at the very heart of the palace of Imperial Byzantium. And there's a corner shop. Well, at least you could say the Byzantines invented corner shops. They had a law about them. There should be one in every street, they said, for the necessities of life. That there, though, that's something else. That's a part of the palace itself. Just part of the foundations, though. Once they held a great high terrace, not that tea house up there. Where the emperors walked each evening in the fading light, their fine silks flowing gently in the fresh sea breezes. Constantinople was the greatest seaport in the medieval world. Arab, Russian, Viking and Italian boats once sailed along these walls. This is the ruin of an imperial pavilion, some 14 centuries old. The warm sea once splashed against these walls. Those are the doors through which the emperor once walked to board the royal yacht, the Greyhound. The emperors like to live beside the seaside, so it's always a good idea when you're walking along the seaside walls of Constantinople to look and see if these little gates give you something of the entrance to the palace. Some of them don't look much today, but they're very interesting. See this Greek text? It's part of a Greek version of the Book of Habakkuk, a text we know once was laid around the base of a great statue of the Emperor Justinian and stood in the centre of the city. So this, then, is not an ancient gateway, because that statue was still standing a few hundred years ago. Where on earth can we find the picture of the Palace of Byzantium? It's still here, of course, in its imitations, in echoes of the great palace of Constantinople, the stand in Sicily and Spain, in Syria and Rome. Villas, gardens, and verandas, all set like tents across the hill. Scented courtyards, splashing fountains, a world that ordinary people never saw. 
Some of their very stones were plundered from the golden palace of Byzantium. There were churches too, filled with the holiest of relics. Fragments of the true cross set in gold and blood red rubies. And great jeweled cups made for the emperor's own communion. And at the heart, at the very center of this magic palace, Byzantium's throne room, the throne room of the emperor of Christendom. As you approach the imperial throne of Byzantium, you'd have felt as naked as a man on judgment day, utterly defenseless. The man who sat on that chair didn't rule by the will of God, he was the will of God on earth. He was God's instrument. He was divine providence personified. Some Byzantines believed that the end of world history would come when that man on that throne took his crown off and laid it on the rock of Calvary. It's probably the most total form of government the world has ever seen. You don't have, for example, participatory government in this. Who can participate in the will of God? You can only bow before it. You can't have morality or loyalty. You can't have good kings or bad kings. Because who can know the workings of the will of this astonishing emperor? That is Byzantine politics. Byzantium ruled with cosmic certainty. It didn't dominate its neighbors with vast armies, but with images of God and government, with bars of gold and promises of princesses in marriage and alliance, all dressed up in the silk robes of Byzantium. The Byzantines operated a kind of cultural imperialism, and at the center of the show was Constantinople, the golden palace and its emperor, the rituals of its church and court. In the 10th century, diplomats and merchants, Easterners and Westerners, all give astonishing descriptions of a weekly procession that wound through the cloisters and the gardens of the palace all filled with singing choirs and ran up to the great church of Saint Sophia. Behold the morning star, they sang, as the emperor approached. In his eyes the sun's rays are reflected. Adore him, ye nations, bow the neck to his greatness. The whole world agreed that this was the most magnificent, the most awe-inspiring sight on earth. At its ending, the procession passed up a wooden walkway that ran right up to the gallery of the great church and entered St. Sophia through this door. Here, high up in the gallery of St. Sophia, was the chapel of the emperors and the court. Below the balcony, in the incense and darkness of the ancient church, pilgrims from Asia, Africa and Europe visited and kissed a thousand holy relics, a little holy land of marble, gold and bronze. In this smaller private space above, the emperors held courtly services and were enrobed for the vast ceremonials that took place each week in the church below. And here they are still, the dynasties of old Byzantium, still walking in the grand procession from a thousand years ago. 
That's the Emperor John the Good up there, all decked out in his Sunday best and carrying a bag of gold for the church. He was a good king. He was from the Comagene family. It was a noble dynasty, died out in 1185. That's his wife. Irene, she was a Hungarian princess. See, she's got blonde hair. And that poor little weedy chap round the corner is their son, Alexis. John desperately wanted him to succeed to the throne, but he died young. That person there is the most celebrated, most married monarch of the Macedonian dynasty, the Empress Zoe. Zoe ruled Byzantium in her own right in the 1050s. But Zoe also had royal blood in her veins, and she legitimized three successive husbands as emperors. That's the last of them. The pious Constantine IX. If you look closely, you can see that the head of that figure has been changed. I bet there were portraits of her other two husbands underneath. Now, the funny thing about this mosaic is that Zoe's portrait's been changed along with her husband's, too. You know, some historians have said that she was very vain. Certain she was beloved of the people of Constantinople, who thought her very beautiful. And you know, she was almost 60 when that portrait was made. In the year 987, Russian ambassadors came south into the sun to see Byzantium. They told their prince, the ambitious Prince of Kiev, that they couldn't begin to describe the splendor of Saint Sophia. They could only say that God dwelt here within it, and they were all baptized. Just as it intended, Byzantium had dominated its neighbors with pious splendor and magnificence. These Russians, though, were tough and warlike. Despite their newfound faith, they still hovered dangerously on Byzantium's northern borders. This is the church they built, the Cathedral of St. Sophia of Kiev. Beneath the old Ukrainian domes, Byzantine brick and ancient Greek geometry. These could be the walls of an imperial church in ancient Constantinople. Inside, memories of the palace of all palaces and the church of all churches the original Saint Sophia of Constantinople. And gleaming mosaics too, made by Byzantine craftsmen sent here to work for Vladimir's son, Prince Yaroslav. Carefully preserved images of Jesus, Mary and the saints. Images of government and holiness to pacify the north the heavenly court of old Byzantium, floating high above the Prince of Kiev. It's a heavenly court, now entirely mirrored in Yaroslav's new court on earth, aided and abetted by a Byzantine bishop who wants him to punish sinners, to feed the poor, and to fight the enemies of Byzantium. But there's something else going on in this wondrous building. Something else yet more subtle. It's like a soap opera here. It imparts manner. It imparts gesture. It shows you the Byzantine way of walking and talking. And between that fierce structure and this new manner, the old order of Rus was entirely swept away. But you know, despite all that, the Byzantines never really trusted the Rus. They didn't have worried, though. The Russians had learnt their lesson very, very well indeed. And centuries later, when Constantinople itself had been thrown away, when Constantinople, the second Rome, had gone, then Moscow, the new capital of the Rus, declared itself as the third Rome.
Just as the dangerous northern tribes passed under Byzantium's golden spell, so did its southern European neighbours in Greece and Italy and the islands of the Mediterranean. Venice, that ancient little town set on the mud banks of the North Italian salt marsh, was the owner of a powerful fleet of warships, as much a menace to Constantinople as were the tribesmen of the north. Beneath the stones of Venice, then, the bricks and columns, the technology and arts of old Byzantium. Just like here, Venice's first churches and its most powerful images of God and government all came here from Byzantium. This was the old Venetian's single most powerful portrait of the face of God. The Paladora, made for the high altar of St. Mark's. It's a funny old thing, actually. It's cobbled up from all sorts of things. Gold strips, bits of jewellery, it's all there, like a magpie's nest. The single most beautiful things about this is these wonderful plaques of enamel. They're Byzantine imports. They were made in the imperial workshops in the year 1105, and they're probably copied from the decorations of a chapel in the imperial palace of Constantinople. That's Christ in the center. All around him, and all in order, large to small, is laid out the court of heaven, just as Byzantium's foreign kings and princes decorated the emperor's court of Constantinople. If you were a useful ally for Byzantium, and you sent off 30 or 40 pounds of gold to Constantinople with a humble letter, the emperor might just honor you with some of these panels, pictures of God and your local saints, and portraits too of you amongst the golden prophets and the angels of Byzantium. This was the power of Byzantium abroad, its prestige, its foreign policy. This little chap here is Ordolafo Fallia, the ruler of the Doge of Venice. He's the man who commissioned the greater part of the Paladoro. Now this is where you can start to see something of that provincial envy of Byzantium starting to work. That envy that almost rose up and threatened to destroy the great imperial empire. Look, I'll show you what I mean. There's the man, there's the Virgin Mary, and there you would expect the man's wife. But it isn't his wife, it is the Empress Irene of Byzantium. So what's going on here? Well, I think the Venetians have sort of rejigged it. So the dear old Doge of Venice, who by Constantinople and rights was a minor official on the edge of empire, suddenly popped up as, a, you know, married to the great Empress. They've also, the Venetians, cunning devils, given him a halo. You see, they've soldered a whole new head on there. The Byzantines would never have sent a figure of a local ruler with a halo on, so he's sort of really bumped up in the holy hierarchy here. But there's one thing the Venetians missed, and this is quite funny, because rulers in a celestial universe wear red socks. The Virgin Mary has red socks, the Empress has red socks, all the kings on this have red socks. But poor old Delafio doesn't. So he isn't really at the top of Byzantium's holy hierarchy. You don't think that's important? Or Delafo would have done. Deep down, he knew that the great Byzantine god that ordered everything within this Christian universe had seen that dubious halo. Also, that this same god held the power of eternal life and death. In 1204, 
the Venetians managed to divert a cutthroat army of crusaders from their sacred vows to capture Palestine for Christendom. Promising them the plunder of Byzantium, they provided lists of the treasures and the holy relics inside Constantinople. On the 13th of April, Venetian war galleys sailed up to the city walls. And the knights of France and Germany, of Italy and England, jumped from the boats onto the battlements. The campaign that followed was a nasty mix of treachery and chaos. At the ending, the city's walls were breached and the imperial throne was overturned. Many Byzantine nobles fled here, to the palace of Black and I, where they were besieged by Henry, the noble prince of Flanders. Now the Venetians knew exactly what was in this palace. They even had an inventory of its contents. And when the nobles gave up the fight, they took everything they could out of the building. Gold, silver, precious jewels, silk, satins, ermine, minerva. The hall was tremendous. More booty, it said, was taken from this town than from all the cities since creation. Over the next 50 years, half of Constantinople was boxed up, crated, and shipped out of the city to Venice and the West. At the very heart of Venice, between the State Palace and St. Mark's, the Old State Church, is the city's ancient treasury. And the root of that treasure was the plunder of Byzantium. It was Europe's pawn shop, really. Emperors left their crowns here for cash. The King of France actually bought the crown of thorns from this room. And in the 1790s, when Napoleon and his armies turned up in Italy, he was able to take half a ton of gold from this room and melt it down just to pay his troops. But despite all of that, despite all the losses, this is still the single place in all the world when you can get a glimmer, just a flash, of the treasure that once filled Byzantium. A glass bowl, enameled with classic images, taken from the emperor's own quarters in the palace. From the palace chapels, the cups of the imperial communion. A golden icon of St. Michael, studded with Indian emeralds. The Byzantines used its glowing colours to foretell the future. This too came from the palace, probably from the chambers of a queen. Inside St. Mark's as well, the altars filled with the holy relics looted from Constantinople. This superb Madonna, Venice's most holy icon, had been carried into battle by the Emperor Alexis Mozuflos. The Venetians tore it from his abandoned war chariot. It's not just the inside of St. Mark's that filled with the plunder of Byzantium. The whole outside of the cathedral is covered in stones stripped from the churches of Constantinople and shipped by the Venetian navy. A great new balcony was built from the stones of old Byzantium and four bronze horses, said to have come from the very heart of Constantinople, were set up high upon it. St. Mark's was plated with the plunder of Byzantium. Today, the old brick church has all but disappeared beneath the foreign marble. 
shiploads of columns from Constantinople now decorate the doorways of the church. These beautiful square pillars from an ancient church that had stood on the main highway of Constantinople were used as gallows. The Venetians hung criminals from them. Other fragments of this lost masterpiece once stood in crusader chapels from Spain to Austria. This is an interesting piece. It has an amazing history. You see, when the Venetians first took the sculpture from the boat, they found that one of the feet had been broken off. So they made a new foot out of a lighter, whiter stone. You see that? Now, just a few years ago in Istanbul, a Turkish archaeologist actually dug up the original foot. So now we know where this sculpture came from. It came from a monument of Constantine the Great, the first king of Byzantium. And those are his four sons. Think of that. We have bits and pieces here from all ages, all styles. This stone is from Egypt. Others are from Syria, from Greece. All that style, that richness that went into Byzantium then has gone to make the city of Venice itself. Back at Constantinople, the Crusaders' colonial administration failed. The knights couldn't balance the books. Driven by debts and petty wars, they left for home. On August the 15th, in the year 1260, a new emperor, Michael VIII, walked in solemn procession through the ancient gates, dressed in the imperial robes of silk and gold, with his choirs, his soldiers and all his priests. Safe inside, he addressed the adoring people of the city who'd labored under foreign rule for 50 years and now celebrated the return of Christ's true emperor to the very center of the earth. In the imperial chapel in the gallery of Saint Sophia, their artists made a celebratory mosaic for the emperor's return. Jesus, Mary, and Saint John the Baptist you'd think the world had never changed. Just 20 feet away, the stone is said to mark the grave of the Venetian who led the Western armies to Constantinople. Enricus Dandolo, the man who broke Byzantium. His bones, they said, were thrown out the window into the street and even the dogs wouldn't eat them. The great mosaic, though, humane, transcendent, optimistic, is the finest single work of all Byzantium's mosaic masters. See how it takes the light. The court of heaven shimmers in the church. This is the Christ the Byzantines had always worshipped. Not a Western Christ upon a cross, impaled in dismal earthly history, but the old Eastern Christ, Christ of all times and of all places, Christ of the palace, Christ of Kiev and of Venice, Christ, Lord of Byzantium. The same Christ too, whose relics and whose images now filled the churches and imagination of the West. The Christ whose soft, impassive face would watch his Eastern Empire gently fade away. This is the great monastery church of St. Saviour in Cora, St. Saviour in the fields. In the last centuries of Byzantium, the city's greatest icons were in this church, waiting to be paraded round the walls in times of siege. Saint Saviour's was Byzantium's last masterwork, the jewel box 
set beside the city walls. Inside these little city churches, many people found their individual answers to the most terrible dilemma that any culture has to face. The threat of annihilation, of the death of a nation. The imperial crown was stored here, alongside the holy pictures. It's said that on the last night of Byzantium, on the 28th of May, 1453, as the Emperor Constantine Paleologus was praying, the Virgin Mary came down from heaven and asked him to return the crown to her as God withdrew protection from his holy city. Above the door in shining gold, an image of the church's greatest benefactor, Theodore Metachites, Prime Minister and High Chancellor of Byzantium. Look at him with his turban and his capital. The very model of an Eastern gentleman. Yet Theodore and the Byzantines were a very ancient people the living remnants of the world of Greece and Rome. Even by Theodore's day though, by the 1320s, the great chancellor had come to the conclusion that Byzantium's ancient heritage was quite exhausted. But all one really had to do was to wait and pray and silently endure. His church is a meditation on eternity. Theodore's artists have given us one of Byzantium's finest images, perhaps one of the greatest paintings ever made. I say that because it's a painting about humanity, about the value of humankind. What's going on? That's Christ in the middle, resplendent white, He's burst through the gates of hell. He's got the hands of Adam and Eve, that's all of us, and he's pulling them from the grave. It's the hands. Look at the hands. It's the hands that's got the urgency in them. The hands that are insisting upon this resurrection, not from earthly empires, but from the value of humankind itself. It was those ideals that drove Byzantium in its final years. The idea that like the kingdom of heaven, Byzantium was not a kingdom of this world. It was a belief in the inevitability that the world came, had a beginning and would come to an end. So when the emperor went onto the walls and took with him the most ancient icons of his faith and knew that he would die, he also knew that he was right. In the 13th century, a family of nomad Turkish shepherds called the Ottomans packed their tents and rode out of Central Asia. Two centuries later, the Islamic armies of the Ottoman Turks, commanded by members of that same family, had conquered most of the territory of Byzantium and a large part of Southeast Europe too. The centre of this enlarging Turkish empire was a city at the borders of modern Greece and Turkey, the city of Edirne, the capital of the Turkish sultans. In those days, Edirne was a hectic international city, the city of great mosques, hospitals, concert halls, munitions works, and grand bazaars. This is one of the colleges of learning at Edirne. In Sultan Mehmet's time, there were many of them here, and they formed a circle like a university around the court. It was an international university. There were Italians here teaching the Sultan's children how to speak Greek. Byzantine nobles sometimes sent their children here for a good education. Old Plethon came here as a young man. Here it was, he met Persian fire worshippers who taught him all about their strange religion. Here it was too. He first read the works of the ancient Greek Aristotle. 
clearly this dynamic, international, rich, powerful society was far more than a match for the poor old empire of Byzantium. It was also clear that the ancient city of Constantinople had been engulfed by this adolescent multinational empire, that Constantinople lay at the strategic center of its trade routes and on the supply lines of the Turkish armies that were eating into Eastern Europe. That is why Byzantium was doomed. In 1438, the Emperor John VIII sailed out of Constantinople in a last attempt to beg aid from the reluctant West in his struggle with the Turks. After 77 days at sea, the Imperial convoy arrived at the friendly port of Venice. The most extraordinary thing about this gallery, that there were bishops and priests from all the cities of the ancient East, all the cities founded by Greece and Rome, the cities of Alexander the Great, the cities of the seven wonders of the world, all had their representatives at the council, all at once and all together. It was as if the old world had come to meet the new. But there was plague abroad in northern Italy. Two Byzantine bishops perished in the first weeks of negotiations. The emperor and his retinue rode away from danger over the mountains and down to the central plain of Italy. Here, perhaps, at Florence, they might forge that union with the West that Byzantium so desperately needed. And here, too, they were memorialized in the frescoes of Benozzo Gozzoli, painted in the townhouse of the Medici family, the bankers who were sponsoring this Council of the Churches. That's John VIII, John Paleologus from Mistra, Emperor of Byzantium, come to the West to seek aid. He'd ruled 12 years at this point. And when he got here, the Florentines, those dedicated followers of fashion, thought he was a knockout. They had never seen turbans like that or crowns like that. The jewelers liked it. The, the Florentine weavers liked it. The painters liked it. This was a man whose dress and demeanor influenced fashion here almost for a century. They didn't like him much, though. They thought all the Greeks were haughty, sarcastic people who seemed to be laughing at jokes that they wouldn't share with the Florentines. Didn't like them at all, really. What they were experiencing, actually, was a typical Greek thing. It was the full force of the divine right of kings. See, in the West that had rather diminished, the West that had pinched the idea of the emperor had now taken to electing Western emperors. They were confirmed by popes. There was common law, power in the West that seeped down and down and down away from the man who now was like only at the top of a vast pyramid of power. In Byzantium, everything resided in the one man. Now, in the West, and here it is, out for a stroll in the country, Cosimo and the other 700 Medici all on their horses. This is entirely reversed. I mean, here you've got a man who is a banker, a politician, a multinational businessman, you might say. The West was entirely different. The central disagreement, then, was about these different attitudes to power in East and West, about power and precedence amongst the lords of earth and heaven. Most of the Byzantines, though, were insulted at the very idea of arguing about God, whose majesty and dignity was beyond all human understanding. They thought that the clever Roman clerics they faced each day were simply impertinent and immature. After a year of recrimination and debate, the Emperor John, still desperate for military aid, simply ordered his delegation to agree to most of the West's arguments.
On the 6th of June, 1439, a great act of union was signed in Florence Cathedral, right under the huge, beautiful, brand new dome. An act of union between two churches, between the Pope of Rome and his assembled clergy, the Emperor of Byzantium, and whichever of his Greeks decided to turn up that day. The real buzz in Florence, though, wasn't in the great cathedral. It was in the streets. The Byzantines were here. These weren't the old school teachers that rich Florentines paid to teach their kids. These were the geniuses, the brightest minds of Byzantium. And here they were carrying all the wisdom of the ancient world, it seemed. Now, the brightest of all these Greeks was Plethon. He taught practically all the people in the Greek delegation. He came straight from mystery. He was very old. He was 80, and he was as charismatic as ever. He gave lectures here, and the effect was amazing. Back at Constantinople, though, the union with Rome caused riots. Italian priests were insulted in the city's churches and Western Europe sent no aid. Disillusioned, disappointed, the Emperor John died a few years later and was buried here in the monastery of Christ Pantocrator, Christ, Lord of Earth and Heaven. And at this same monastery, Gennadius, the theologian, preached that the union with Rome would bring down the wrath of God upon Byzantium. Meanwhile, at Edirne, a new young Turkish sultan, Mehmet, had taken up the Ottoman throne. For Constantinople, the new emperor, John's brother, Constantine, soon discovered that he now had a dangerous and most impatient neighbour. Constantine XI, Constantine of Mistra, was childless and a widower. The last emperor would leave no heir. On the last day of Byzantium, an eerie quiet fell over the city. Mehmet had told the Turks to rest for a whole day before the last assault. He gave the emperor time to walk with all that was left of the armies and nobles of Byzantium once again into the great church. And there, after all their arguing at Florence, the Greeks and the Latins joined together in a last service and the emperor went to the altar and was given the last rites. Then he walked back to the palace, and there he made a speech to his commanders. A speech, you might say, that was the last speech of the ancient world. He encouraged them not to be frightened when the Turks attacked. He said that their ancestors, the ancient Romans, were terrified when Hannibal's elephants had charged towards them. That they hadn't run away. Because they were human beings, people with will and mind, and not given to animal desires, and that he and his commanders had mind and will and God and belief upon their side. It was those beliefs of mind that stem back to Greece and Rome and fuel the modern world. And then Constantine, the eleventh of that name, went with his men back to the outskirts of his empire, to the walls now of his city. And there he died, the ruler of Rome, the king of Christendom, and the emperor of Byzantium. What actually happened to him is a mystery. Turkish historians tell us only that the emperor was very brave. The Constantine died fighting by the city gates. The city is taken, he's supposed to have cried, and I'm still alive and he ran off towards the battle and into the flash of legend. The man then killed ten pashas and sixty soldiers with his lance, and at the end, poor Constantine was toppled from his horse and cried to God Almighty, the creator of the universe. 
and the Turks cut off his head and stuck it on a pole. As he rode through the streets of Constantinople on the first day of the Turkish conquest, Sultan Mehmet found whole districts of the sacred city derelict and abandoned, saw hovels and graveyards built amongst the ruins of its legendary palaces. He was awed, though, by the Imperial Church of St. Sophia and declared its venerable shell to be a building made for God. So the Church of St. Sophia, the Church of the Divine Wisdom, was converted to the Mosque of Aya Sophia, the Mosque of the Divine Wisdom. Images of old Byzantium had glimmered at the edge of Asia for a thousand years. Now new ghosts, new legends and new peoples came to haunt its fabled stones. Legend tells that Mehmed rode into St. Sophia on his war horse and placed his finger in this magic column and spun the church around to face Mecca for a call to prayer. History tells that the Sultan ordered the tomb of Constantine the Great, the founder of Byzantium, to be demolished, along with the burial church of the ancient emperors, and this great mosque, the funerary mosque of Mehmet the Conqueror, was put up in its place. Most of Constantinople's ancient churches, though, were soon converted into mosques. This little mosque was once a chapel in the ancient palace of Byzantium. Endowed with lands and properties, these converted churches were transformed into self-financing charitable trusts, the religious and financial centers of the city's neighborhoods and the means by which Constantinople was converted to Islam and revived. Under Turkish rule, Constantinople was to become a rich and thriving city once again, the center of a mighty empire, just as it had been a thousand years before. Just before the conquest of Constantinople, a radical young bishop called Bessarion, Plethon's most brilliant pupil, had returned to Italy and had been made a cardinal of Rome. Some historians detect his portrait in this tragic bearded figure talking with Italian friends, chic young men of the Renaissance, painted by Piero della Francesca. Here at Rome, Vasarian did what Byzantines had done at Constantinople for centuries. He made a villa by the city walls. This villa, one of the first in the modern Western world. A memory of old Byzantium. Vasarian spent his life making a memorial for Byzantium by founding an academy of scholars. You know, I suppose Bessarion bought his academy here when he got very hot in the summer months. This academy was a group of people who he'd gathered around him. Some were exiled Byzantines, many of them were Europeans. But everybody who could help him hold the identity of Byzantium together for as long as possible. Poets, artists, writers, translators, all sorts of people. Couldn't have been that difficult to find people because this was a really fashionable idea. 
dear old Plethon had introduced Plato to the West. The Renaissance was beginning. This is early Renaissance building. For a few years, this was the coolest place on the planet. So you've got to think, perhaps, that this was the place to where one day in the summer, 1452, Bessarion sat down to write to Mistra. He was writing a letter of condolence to Plethon's sons. The old man had died with the spring flowers in June of that year. Bessarion wrote a letter, such a letter. He said that Plethon had been his teacher, his father and his friend. It was one of the last authentic letters of the ancient world. After that, Byzantium became something to be seen in libraries and museums. Above all, Bessarion preserved the dream. He gathered the pure air of Mystra, the ideals of Constantinople, the energy of ancient wisdom, and made a single beauteous image of that most complicated empire. Bessarion was an enabler, a producer, a preserver of ideas and images, the assembler of the largest Byzantine library the world has ever seen. A collection whose fragments are still stored in the great libraries of the West. The man was Mr. Byzantium. He supported huge numbers of fellow exiles. He also used to place refugees all over Europe in jobs. This is a handmade Greek text of Homer's Iliad, made by a refugee from Mystra. And in the front of this beautiful volume is a picture of Homer wearing a Byzantine hat. The West had seen nothing like this flood of wisdom that was pouring from Byzantium. Homer, ancient Roman law, and a myriad of other texts. And they'd seen nothing like Bessarion's Academy. Part of the modern world, its science and its scholarship, was started by these exiles from Byzantium. Plethon and Bessarion first taught the West old Plato's heady individualism that so fills the modern world. Bessarion, too, told a Westerner about an ancient text that inspired Columbus to sail west from Europe on the east wind to America. There is, though, a deeper and yet more fundamental legacy a vision of a universal order that stretches back through Byzantium, through Roman Greece to the Bible and the most ancient East. Nowadays, Constantinople, the heart of old Byzantium, is called Istanbul, an old Byzantine phrase that simply means the city. Inside the modern city, though, the past is disappearing. Ruins are often melancholy, but they should seldom make you angry. The end of Byzantium wasn't really brought about by the wicked West or the terrible Turk. Things pass, as the poet said. The cowboys had never shot the Indians. The Great Plains would not be filled with shining teepees and herds of buffaloes. Nonetheless, we should honour the past and cherish it. It's a memory, a solid memory of our beginnings. And think of Byzantium too, as a flash of silver, as a dream of jewels, as an image of a god sitting on a golden throne and of an emperor sitting in this palace in his imitation. Think of the culture that gave us the rule of Roman law, and the image of a holy mother, much beloved, caressing a baby child. 
and think of Byzantium too, this extraordinary empire set between the east and west, whose very ending set those two things far apart, but in whose own time gave so many good ideas to both of them. When sailing from Byzantium, listen to the city's fading sounds. Visit in your mind its golden images and all the shadows of its history. And as you wave goodbye, you'll discover that you can never really leave the past behind.